Welcome to Theory Neutral, the podcast about stuff languages do. I'm Aiden. I'm Logan. Uh, my name is Rick, and today we're talking about the article The Geography and Development of Language Isolates by Matthias Urban. Listeners may have noticed that Rick is not Jacob. Uh, Jacob is unfortunately under the weather on our recording day today. So here's Rick. Hi. Uh, I'm a friend of Aiden's and Logan's uh, from the study group they formed uh, earlier last year. And uh, I'm a geology grad student, and uh, I've always also been interested in linguistic typology and in language in general, and linguistic diversity in general, and uh, I suppose that's why I'm here. Welcome to the show. I should note that this article in general felt very familiar because of paleoecological studies basically use basically kind of these methods with noticeable changes. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if if you find this article more familiar than like I do at least because I have basically no background in statistics whatsoever. I am definitely used to more like qualitative studies than qual quantitative studies. So all of the math that he's talking about with statistics and so forth, I'm like, I'm going to take your word that all of that is true because I have no idea what those words mean. So uh, this article talks about language isolates, which are languages that, as far as we can tell, using the comparative method or any of the traditional tools of historical linguistics, are unrelated to any other language on Earth. And so what this article is trying to do is that it's trying to see the geographic distribution of language isolates, where they are in the world, uh, whether there are topographic influences on where uh, language isolates are in the world, and whether it can statistically quantify any sort of relationship between uh, topography, other geographic factors, and where language isolates find themselves geographically. It's a very statistical paper trying to do math on the overall distribution of these things. Um, and I feel, like, I feel like it's worth noting, at least I personally find statistical papers on linguistic typology, or at least language stuff in general, they can not be very easy to pull off well because language is really complicated. Language internal systems are all connected to each other in all sorts of complicated ways. Languages are all connected to each other in all sorts of complicated ways. And oftentimes it feels like, at least to me, like the set of all extant human languages is not a statistically significant sample size because it's just so much complexity that you would have to like overwhelm with us with a huge data set and there's only you know so many languages in the world and i don't think there are large enough data set you've got language families you've got linguistic areas you've got all sorts of things that are that are giving you know more reasons for things to co-occur or to occur across a range of languages than just they just naturally do for whatever reason you're trying to investigate so it's all it can be very difficult they are not statistically independent there's also the fact that a a uh, substantial number of human languages have gone extinct, either in historic times or long before that. Yes. And that sort of thing makes it so that there's typological diversity that we don't have access to because it's in the past, and there's no way of knowing it unless there's somehow we get lucky. Exactly. There, there, that's a whole additional issue. But this paper doesn't exactly have that problem because... What it's studying is not an internal property of language, but the family status itself of a language, which means that, you know, shared inheritance is not a problem because that's what we're talking about, the lack thereof. And it's something that is completely independent of linguistic areas and so forth. So it's it's just investigating whether or not something is an isolate or it's that's the only property of a language that it cares about. And that's not exactly a straightforward property. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It's but not, at yeah. the very least, it's a lot more straightforward than some sort of language internal grammatical or phonological property. It's completely it, like separate from questions of you know linguistic influence and so forth. And so this is the kind of paper where I think you really can do some statistics and get some good results out and not be stymied by the fact that you need to account for more languages than exist in your data sample before you can do good statistics. Yeah, you don't need to care that much for this kind of study for all the human languages that have ever existed or could exist. 
it is maybe worth fleshing out some of the uh, historical precedents for this because uh, like I'm familiar enough with like Joanna Nichols's work on uh, the influence of geography on language, which the author does address a little bit. He talks about uh, spread zones and residual zones or accretion zones, which are which are terms that I know for sure that he lifted straight from Nichols. So uh, what a spread zone is a geographical area. The Eurasian steppe is a commonly cited example where uh, you get remarkably little diversity because a one language family spreads out over an area and then later you might get a different family that spreads out over the same area and you get that process repeating itself over and over over time uh, while you have residual zones the Caucasus is frequently cited sometimes you see New Guinea cited as an example or the western coast of what is now California cited as an example it's uh, places where linguistic diversity tends to build up you tend to see many families crammed into a geographically smaller area over time because of four topographical reasons. And I got the sense that one of the things that this author was trying to address is to what extent do those topographical features contribute to uh, diversity being where it is. Yes, this study is kind of trying to investigate, like, is there a connection between certain kinds of geographical features and status as an isolate or location of an isolate? and trying to figure that out statistically. So one of the big confounding factors that does still exist here is that there are apparently geographic features that produce language diversity in general, and that might be difficult to separate from geographical features that specifically produce isolates. So there are two hypotheses that the author was investigating. Uh, the first being that language isolates pop up just wherever there happens to be more linguistic diversity. And if that is the case, then we would need to do more investigation to figure out, okay, why is there more linguistic diversity there? And can we separate out any features that might be specifically relevant to isolates? And the other hypothesis is that isolates specifically are more likely than just general diverse languages within a family in specific geographical areas. And he cites the two main things that he was testing on with respect to the second hypothesis of the fact that topography, it's topographically specific, is that you have distance to coastline being one of the possible drivers of diversity of getting specifically isolates in those kinds of areas and the other kind was was uh being along the spine of a mountain belt which uh both of those were used as proxies for testing out that second hypothesis yeah and and the intuition there is that you know maybe you would see more isolates in those areas because there used to be a big family of languages and then some other language family spread out and displaced the original languages until you ended up with a super contracted family where there's only one member left at the edge of these geographic regions. So that kind of makes sense. And yeah. it, it makes sense why you might want to then say, okay, well, can we find statistical evidence that that is actually the case? Um, but it turns out there is another uh, confounding factor that makes that a little difficult to investigate, which is that what actually counts as an isolate is itself kind of a squishy, hard to define thing. Um, Rick gave a definition from the paper, but you'll note that it depends on what the accepted methods of comparative linguistics happen to be and what we happen to know about existing language families, all of which is stuff that can change. Well, and more than that, it depends, like, the definition just sort of assumes that we know what a language is, and that's the real problem here, I think, because if you look at any conglomeration of speech varieties, you will find variety in them. And trying to quantify how much variety there is is not a straightforward thing. Yes. And, you know, we may have talked about this on the podcast before. If not, it's a well-known problem of, like, when do you say that this is one language versus two if they're relatively different but not so different varieties of it that you're yeah. trying to compare? And so, obviously, the problem ends up cropping up in isolates as well because it's like, well, the definition is there's one language. But, like, do we know it's one language? 
have we decided arbitrarily that it's one language? Yeah, is there extra linguistic reasons? Exactly. And and to be fair, uh, that issue is brought up in the paper, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, he has a few examples of circumstances where it is not entirely clear whether this thing that is called an isolate is actually a single isolated language, or whether it's just a really tiny family of two or three languages. Exactly. And like, you can you can certainly ask the question of like, is there really a significant difference between literally one language and, yeah, there's kind of two or three and they're really close to each other. Like, honestly, the second doesn't feel like it's really significantly different from an isolate for this kind of a purpose. Yeah. But technically, it doesn't meet the definition. So, you know, you kind of have to deal with that. I think I think a couple of good examples of this are... Like, in his data set, Korean is not counted as an isolate, I assume because Jeju, the island off the south of Korea, has its own Koreanic language that most people at this point recognize as separate. And you totally could make an argument that the language of northern Korea and the language of southern Korea have diverged enough at this point that you could argue that they're a different thing. Yeah, I don't know enough about that. I'm pretty sure... Jeju is distinct, yeah. Uh, Jeju is a pretty clear case, but... Historically, Korean has been considered an isolate because people haven't known about Jeju and that wasn't there for the to not be an isolate anymore. Another example is Basque, which is again traditionally considered an isolate. It's a very prominent example of an isolate, but it also has enough internal diversity that you could make an argument that there's at least two languages in there. But it's hard to say because it's a, it's, it's a big continuum. It's, you know, one of those sorts of difficult to quantify messes. So the data set for this paper treats Korean as not an isolate and Basque as an isolate, I don't know that either of those is wrong, and I don't know that either of those is right, and maybe the statistics is robust enough that it doesn't matter if edge cases like that aren't always treated yeah. perfectly consistently. It is worth noting that a fair proportion of the information in his data set come from places that are, you know, that have recently been better studied, but historically are understudied, places like New Guinea or the Amazon mm-hmm. Basin or uh, the Circum-Pacific in general. Yeah, and he has he has a couple of weird points in his data anyway. Like I don't know where his, his the map that he he has for where his isolates are does not seem to include Ainu, which is weird. And he has he also includes some some historical languages that are just considered unclassified on deficiency of data. He's got a couple of those in Britain, and I don't know what those are because I'm pretty sure the consensus is that any attested language in the British Isles at this point is Celtic at the earliest. Yeah, like there's nothing pre-Celtic that was attested, but I don't. Know. Maybe, maybe, again, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe there's something I'm not aware of. I just looked at his map and I was like, mostly this makes sense, but there's some unexpected yeah. holdouts. There's some unexpected places. I would have expected to see some isolates in some places that I didn't. I think given the particular results that are reported, it probably ends up not mattering. If the results were different, then we might be able to critique them based on the messiness of the data set. But the main takeaway after doing all the statistics is that actually the hypothesis that isolates specifically are more likely in specific geographical areas is really difficult to support. There's maybe a little bit of influence of mountains, but it could just be statistical noise. Yeah, he finds stronger support that the mountain belt hypothesis is important. Yeah, but that brings up just a general point about research, um, which is that I feel like it was very bold to actually publish a what is effectively a null result, um, because that doesn't get done often enough. Um, just it is it is the culture of scientific publishing that we like to see really exciting positive results, and that results in bias in the literature. So good job, Matthias Urban, for publishing what is maybe not a super exciting result, but it's valuable to see that oh yeah, somebody has already actually investigated this. And this is what they came up with. So if somebody else has the same question, we don't need to waste time doing exactly the same thing again. We can look at what's already been done. Yeah, we can cross that one off. And it's not just valuable in telling us, yeah, you don't need to look into this. It's valuable in saying, I looked into this one thing and it didn't turn out. But now, because I did that, we've discovered that, you know, here are all of the problems that came up while doing this investigation. Exactly. Yeah. And so maybe 
now you know about those problems, maybe you can find a way to get around them. Maybe you can pick out another related idea that came up in the course of this investigation and go investigate that, which we wouldn't have known to, to do if the null result had not been published in the first place. It is worth noting that he does even sort of say in the discussion section where that he kind of felt that his methods were too simple because he, start, he talks about how uh, he's just measuring raw distance from a coastline or raw distance from a mountain range, which if you wanted to, you could also overlay ecological diversity over it because sometimes that's a factor. You could overlay the type of climate that you're in because that could also be a factor. All of those things are potential drivers of diversity in the languages spoken in an area that if you wanted to, somebody totally could investigate that influence too. Yeah, I think I think it's worth talking about because I don't I don't know that we've talked about as much his reasoning behind the choice of mountain ranges and coasts as geographical features that he expects or that he hypothesizes we could flesh that out so he, he actually gives a couple of case studies of languages whose history is known or at least fairly clearly reconstructable that have been either rendered isolates or kept isolated by virtue of the fact that other people have come in and kicked them out of the nice parts of the countryside and pushed them to the kinds of places that nobody's really going to expend a whole lot of effort to try and conquer and populate with other people. Um, he gives the example of Burushaski, which is spoken in a couple of mountain valleys in Afghanistan that are very high... In Pakistan. Or Pakistan, yeah. That are very high, very inhospitable, very difficult to live in, and not on the way to anything in particular. And his argument is like, this has... Burushaski has sort of ended up as an isolate because all of the, the nicer territory that the family might have encompassed in the past got conquered by other people who wanted it. And now it's left in the part of the countryside that nobody else particularly wanted. I have also seen the expression Burushaski distribution in the literature, where a language ends up having a distribution that's disjunct and separated over uh, two river valleys that are separated sort of by a mountain because of the historical process of peoples from lowland areas slowly making their way highland. Mm -hmm. And that kind of is basically what happened to Burushaski. Which I'd never heard that term before, but that's that's a really useful term to, to think about, because that is, it's, yeah, he gives a map of Burushaski's distribution relative to the languages around it, and it's very striking how, I mean, in general, this whole place is just a bunch of, like, valleys and very windy passageways where the rest of it is mountains that nobody lives in. But Burushaski in particular is bifurcated and in two separate valleys with another valley in between them that has no Burushaski speakers at all. And it's just sort of this weird disjoint relic area in this already complicated environment. It's really interesting. The languages around it are in, some of them are in the Dardic family of Indo-Iranian and uh, some of them are Indic. I don't remember if there are any Iranian languages in that area, but it wouldn't surprise me. It's it's a it's just a it's it's a really neat map to look at. He also mentions uh, just as an aside on Burushaski, he also mentions that because there is this geographic separation, those two varieties of Burushaski are starting to drift apart from each other, and maybe it's not going to be an isolate anymore. But again, does that matter for this purpose? Good question. The distance of coastline hypothesis also has ecological influence. Like in general. The hypothesis there is that peoples who live in lowland areas near a coastline tend to be in places that are... You can quite easily make a living off of catching the food that's in the sea, which makes it so that there isn't really a reason for any one language variety to go out and diversify and want to take over new land for expressly for the purpose of trying to make a living. And so this particular type of geography encourages smaller communities that are mostly going to be self-sufficient anyways, which causes there to be diversity. Yeah, and on top of that, those areas of coast are often not super great for agriculture, so agriculturists coming in and wanting a whole bunch of extra land are more likely to leave, at least in his, his account, are more likely to leave coastal isolate communities kind of alone, because like, eh, it's not the greatest land, they can do their own thing there, it's fine. Uh, the most striking example he gives, I think, was uh, off the southwest coast of a, a, what is now California, where uh, there's uh, this language 
that uh, used to be the smallest member in its family, but is now has the greatest number of speakers, but in part by virtue of the fact that it was spoken in an insular area that is hard for agriculture. Yeah, exactly. So it was not the greatest place in that family. So everybody else had more speakers, but everybody else had better land. And so the Europeans kicked them off that land. And now this place, this particular variety is doing... Yeah, it's the Kashaya language in Pomoan. Yeah, it's comparatively significantly better, even if in like independently, it's probably a little bit worse off anyway than it was before. So having now talked about all of the reasons why specific geography might create isolates in particular, Aiden, you have some personal experience with why general diversity might generate isolates, regardless of what geographic features might underlie the generation of general diversity. Yeah, so Urban talks about what he calls the normal diachrony assumption, which is basically that if left alone, a language will over time grow and diversify and become more than one language and become a whole family. And so, you know, his theory is that isolates basically represent the reduction of a pre-existing language family. And, you know, maybe we don't have any access to what the rest of that language family looked like, but in theory, there used to be languages more, more languages related to these isolates and they're just all gone now. I'm not entirely sure that that is a reasonable assumption. I, in principle, sure, absolutely, but in certain cases, I don't know that it is. So when I, I was in uh, Papua New Guinea for a little while a few years ago doing some, I was going to do field work and then I got sick and didn't, so I did it all on tapes instead. But the, the language that I was working on from those recordings, is, it's a little language called Yare, spoken by about 700 people in the absolute middle of nowhere, even by Papua New Guinea standards. Jungly lowlands, fun place. But... The impression that I got from sort of listening to the tapes, listening to some of the, you know, reading some of the, the uh, documentary material that had been provided by the people that took the tapes about the place, about the people, I don't really get the impression that this is necessarily like a relic population or something that we would expect to maybe grow in the future if left alone, because it, it, it just sort of seems like a relatively stable situation. There's this little space and that belongs to the Yare, and, you know, if somebody marries into them, then they their kids speak Yare, and if somebody marries out, then their kids speak whatever they married out into, and it sort of just maintains these boundaries. In it seems like, to me, in a very impressionistic way, that Yare is just kind of in this, this stable state where it's neither growing nor contracting, and I don't see much of a reason in that particular case to expect it to do all that much of anything. And sure, if all of the neighboring languages suddenly disappeared, it would probably start to expand and eventually turn into multiple languages. But, like, it seems to be just fine where it is right now. And maybe that's, again, because, like, it's not the best of land and nobody else wants it. But, I don't know. The, the normal diacrity assumption thing struck me as, like, yeah, I can see some exceptions to this, depending on how you define leaving a language alone. Maybe this doesn't count. I don't know. But it's, it's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. And... I will point out that Aiden has in fact written the most up-to-date grammar of Yare that currently exists. <laughs> Yes, well, grammar is an overstatement because I think of grammars as like five, six, seven hundred pages, and this was about 120 because all I had was tapes and I didn't get to ask any more questions about a whole lot of things that I had a lot of questions about. But it is the most complete documentation that anybody has done so far. Yes, which is still not saying much, but it, it is accessible and out there and you can read it. And it's better than the, the unpublished manuscript from the people that took the data before, I hope. That is a, one of the very first criticisms I had of this is what's the difference between a language isolate and a really small family. But I feel like it's maybe worth fleshing out that there are parallels that can quite easily be made to, uh, uh, to the fossil record or to the biological record quite easily. Easily because uh, these are in many ways kind of similar systems. When folks who are studying biodiversity across time look at the fossil record, they run into very similar types of issues that there we, do, we only have the fossil data and we don't have any of the other kinds of data that you would normally use to see if two different fossil taxa are indeed different taxa. And so what tends to be done is that folks just sort of use the morphological definition of a species and uh, they just muddle through it and whatever works works, especially when you're working with a fossil record, that's what will work best. 
if you were an ecologist working in a modern day setting, that sort of problem is not there. But you have a whole variety of different kinds of problems where you could use the biological definition of a species where if you have two individuals that can interbreed, then they're probably of the same species. But that definition remarkably reminds me of like a dialect continuum a fair bit, where sometimes you have one taxon that can interbreed with the one the next valley over and you can repeat that for a bit, but then at the two extremes extreme ends of the continuum. If you brought in two individuals, one from either end of the spectrum, they probably wouldn't be able to interbreed. Yeah, it's the, I think the concept is called ring species as well. Well, that's even a whole extra mess. Ring species is a slightly different, yeah. it, it's very similar, but it's not exactly the same because uh, in certain kinds of ring species situations, you have some sort of, in, some sort of very sharp break inside the continuum. Yeah, and there is a direct analogy there between mutual intelligibility of of language varieties and interfertility of different biological populations. And to maybe stretch the analogy a little bit farther than it really ought to go, you even have something like aerial effects in the biological domain via horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, which reminds me quite a bit of borrowing of uh, lexical items or even borrowing of typological features between languages that can be right next to each other. And we absolutely do know that horizontal gene transfer was very important in the early evolution of life on Earth. And the evolution of mammals. Yeah, that too. Yep. Fascinating stuff. It's really amazing how many parallels you can draw between language evolution and biological evolution. And there are very similar processes at play between increase in biodiversity in a geographic area, and there are some parallels that you can draw between the diversification that happens when a language family moves into a different area for any one of a variety of reasons. So to wrap up a little bit here, just to kind of summarize, so um, Orban goes through all of the statistics and does all of his math, again, that I don't really understand very well, but that he, he has some nice charts that are fairly clear to understand and ends up showing that, yeah, his hypothesis that there are specific, specific geographical features that promote and sort of catch isolates doesn't seem to hold up statistically, and instead it seems to be the case that isolates just happen where diversity happens, which sort of suggests further areas of research as well, like we should go and start trying to figure out why are linguistically diverse areas diverse? What about those locations causes it? Is it geographical? Is there some sort of human cultural thing instead? Is there both? Is there what's going on here? There's a lot of interesting questions that I'm sure people have been trying to answer and I'm just unaware of it because this is not my like particular subfield. But there's at least one of the other nice things about this paper, you know, besides just being like, hey, I tried this thing and that means it didn't work so we can cross it off. But also, like, it's clear where to go from here. It's clear that, like, okay, this is the direction that we need to start looking based on the fact that that didn't seem to pan out. You could also improve the statistical modeling to account for different geographical features, too, if you wanted, if you still wanted to explore the hypothesis that certain topographical features cause there to be isolates in an area. Uh, he does still hold out the idea that the, the influence of mountain ranges is still possibly not just statistical noise, which I think is interesting, that the coastline hypothesis he uh, doesn't find evidence for, but the mountain range one he still does find evidence for. Mm -hmm. At least a little bit. Not that much, but a little bit. Which is interesting. Theory Neutral is made possible by our listeners, families, and friends. Follow us on Twitter at theory underscore neutral, or send us an email at theory.neutral.podcast at gmail.com. Join us next time when we will be discussing evidentials. <laughs>